Um, we're going to have it moderated by Bruce Stokes, who's a senior transatlantic fellow for economics at the at the German Marshall Fund. And there you go. Uh, Bruce is a noted expert on trade and international economics. Uh, many of you know Bruce for his uh, two decades work as a columnist for National Journal, where he uh, was really one of the more insightful uh, commentators on economic issues in the country. Uh, he's now as a monthly columnist for the European Voice newspaper in Brussels. He's the author of a 2009 uh, German Marshall Transatlantic Trends Survey and a 2006 book, America Against the World, How We Are Different and Why We Are Disliked. He's also a former senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a member of that council. Uh, and in 1995 was picked by Washingtonian Magazine as one of the best on business reporters in Washington. So, and I'm also gonna join this panel. So. Thanks Rob. Um, I don't need to introduce our first speaker who is Rob. Uh, but I would point out to you among his other accomplishments, um, he is the, I guess the chair or co-chair? Co-chair. Co-chair of a task force, a U.S.-China task force on innovation uh, policy. So it's uh, very much uh, uh, in line with what we're going to be uh, talking about uh, today. Uh, to his right is Armin Cohen, who is the executive director of the Clean Air Task Force. Um, and also the co-founder of that, of that group, uh, which works on reducing atmospheric pollution and commercializing innovative uh, clean energy technologies uh, with particular work on CCS. Uh, and to his right is Jamie White, the staff director of the Subcommittee on Trade, Customs, and Global Competitiveness of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, which his, his, committee, his subcommittee is chaired by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Um, uh, Jamie has worked on Capitol Hill uh, for quite a long time, actually were 10 years in the House before he joined uh, the Senate where he worked for Congressman uh, Jim McDermott. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Rob, and uh, then we'll go to Armin and then to Jamie, and then we'll start a discussion, so. Okay, all right, well thanks Bruce. Um, so we heard, you know, you hear a lot about the fact that the U.S. is lagging, uh, we, we, we don't have a price on carbon, we're cutting, maybe not expanding our, our investments in clean energy, we don't do deployment subsidies, and yet the Chinese are doing all of these things. Uh, let's just hitch the wagon to the Chinese and have them pull us into this clean energy nirvana. Let me suggest that that's really fundamentally wrong, and I'll tell you why I think it's wrong. Uh, I think it's wrong for the principal reason that if all we're trying to do is we've got a set of these cost curves, these technology platforms, and all we're trying to do is drive those platforms to price down, that's a perfect strategy. The Chinese strategy is a perfect strategy. But if we're really arguing, as I think Arun said this morning, we're trying to get new cost curves, the Chinese strategy is a fundamentally destructive one. And I will say why. And that's because the Chinese are practicing a very aggressive form of what we call innovation mercantilism. My colleague Stephen Izell and I recently wrote a report called, the, called uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Global Innovation Policy. And it documented what a lot of countries around the world were doing, including China. But let me give you a couple of examples of what China is doing that I think fundamentally hurt innovation, not advance it. Number one, they turn a blind eye, and not only turn a blind eye, but put their eye on intellectual property theft. Uh, they are rampant in terms of IP theft. A good example of that, American Semiconductor, which is a wind company in the U.S., recently, just a month ago, filed a suit against Sinovel, which is a Chinese wind company, where they assert that they essentially stole the software for their wind turbine control systems. Uh, I can't judge the merit of that case, but given the Chinese history, I would bet you any amount of money that case is true, that assertion is true. The, if the Chinese are stealing our innovations, our technology, the incentive for American companies to innovate and be at the leading edge, create these new cost curves, these new technology curves, uh, systemically uh, goes down. The Chinese make foreign markets contingent upon, access to foreign market contingent upon us giving them their tech, our technology. Sam talked about this this morning, this afternoon, said that was a good thing. I think that's a terrible thing. It violates the WTO, it's against the WTO laws, and yet we don't enforce it. 
And the Chinese are able to get away with it because they are such a huge, huge market. They did that with regard to uh, the Spanish wind turbine company made and uh, a German wind turbine company, Nordex. They basically forced them to give them the Chinese their technology to get market access. And again, that takes the incentive away from innovation global leaders to keep in innovating. Uh, the second area that they hurt us is they limit access to their markets. So you want global market access to get the biggest scale so you get the most money to reinvest in, in, in R&D and innovation. Chinese have an 8% tariff on renewable energy imports. Uh, the Chinese government basically has set a rule. Their SOEs, their state-owned enterprises and others simply are not allowed to buy foreign technology. Uh, the Chinese government recently uh, issued a domestic a bid for wind turbines uh, and they issued, it awarded 25 contracts. Guess what? Not a single non-Chinese contract was awarded. Foreign companies basically just have given up because they realize the bidding system is rigged. And the last is subsidies. Now you could argue subsidies are a good thing. Um, they want to subsidize clean technology. Aren't we all the benefit, the beneficiaries? We get lower prices. It gets, we saw that cost curve this morning. Uh, let me say why that. I don't think that's a good thing, but let me explain the subsidies. At least a 40% subsidy on currency manipulation. You would not have seen that curve this morning without that. 40% subsidy through currency manipulation. Uh, dumping. They're selling below cost. Their SOEs don't have to make a profit. Their SOEs can actually make about a 5% loss every year. Uh, there's an ITC case that was just filed three or four weeks ago against the Chinese on crystal and silicon, uh, basically arguing that uh, there's dumping going on. Chinese wind farms get a 50% VAT rebate. Uh, there's $2 billion in direct subsidies for wind alone. Massive low interest loans from state-owned banks, who which in turn don't have to make a profit. Uh, the Chinese Development Bank recently provided $17 billion of loans for China's solar energy company. This makes Solyndra look like a little SBA loan. <laughs> China's solar PV subsidies 50, provide 50% to 70% of capital costs for buildings. Direct subsidies of $2.92 per US per watt. Uh, China Development Bank, which has 20 times more export financing uh, excuse, excuse me, different. China Development Bank uh, basically just gave Goldwyn, the leading Chinese wind company, six billion dollar line of credit. When you're against that much subsidy, including the currency on top of it, you simply cannot compete. And that's what we've seen over the last year. Company after company either going out of business or cutting back. Now again, why, would, why do we worry about that? Uh, the Chinese will innovate. We don't need to worry about that. I would assert that that's basically, uh, we're fundamentally the innovators, they're fundamentally the engineering copiers. And that's going to be the case for a long, long time. And that is the natural order of things, not because I'm some sort of American chauvinist. It's the natural order of things based on any sort of, any sort of international economics assessment of comparative advantage. Let me close by just citing a study by uh, a colleague of ours, Erica Fuchs, who's a professor of, chem of electrical engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. And Erica did to me one of the best studies I've ever seen on this. She looked at two major technologies. I'm going to quote the study from the optoelectronics industry. And looked at the impact of Chinese subsidization and, and just massive cost redu reduction through subsidies on the effect on innovation on the optoelectronics industry. Uh, and I will assert that it's the same for solar. So in this study, which was called Design for Location, the Impact of Manufacturing Offshoring on comp Technology Competitors in the Optoelectronics Industry, which you can get on SSRN, she finds that, quote, if optoelectronic components, actually let me back up by saying what her study was really looking at was two technologies. One current cost curve, which is called second generation photonics switching, and the new technology, which is an American technology developed by three American firms, which is basically on-chip photonic switching, which is now beyond all my knowledge. It's all I know. It's better. It's something on the chip. But it's like so much better and potentially so much cheaper. 
It's not cheaper now because you're at the beginning of the cost curve, but if you move down the cost curve, it's so much better, so much cheaper than current technology that the Chinese now all make. So here's what she finds in her study. If optoelectronic components firm shift production from the United States to countries in the East Asia, the, em the emerging designs that were developed in the U.S. no longer pay. The emerging designs, however, have characteristics that in the long run make them more valuable to pushing forward Moore's law. The emerging designs produced in the U.S. cannot cost compete with the prevailing design in China. These constraints create a dilemma for the optoelectronics firms. They must choose between reducing costs by moving manufacturing offshore or staying in the U.S. and pushing forward the new technology in hopes of competing, not on cost but on performance. And essentially what she says, if they move offshore, they cease to push forward research in R&D and optoelectronics integration, and therefore there could be dire implications for long-term technology development. That, to me, says it all. That is essentially what's happening today. The Chinese are subsidizing current technology. We all feel real good. It's kind of like getting cheap heroin. It makes us feel good for a while. But fundamentally, it's going to retard the development of this next generations of technology that we really need to get clean technology lower than uh, the price of coal and oil around the world. Rob, let me, let me uh, follow up there for one sure. second. So if I understand you correctly, you aren't worried that the next generation of innovation will take place in China. You're worried the next level generation of innovation won't take place. Correct. Exactly right. I think the Chinese uh, fundamentally are not super innovative. Now, it's not to say they won't get there. What I think the Chinese are really good at, and that's that sort of engineering incremental innovation. They, they, they got a boatload of good engineers, and they don't cost a lot of money, and they throw scores and hundreds of them at a problem, and they can take our stuff, and they can move it along, and with subsidies, and they, they can move you down that cost curve pretty well. I don't see any evidence that they're working to get to that next cost curve, if you will, next technology curve down. That's to me the big challenge from China is they're going to limit that global innovation. Right. Carmen? Good. Um, I'll just start by, since my name was invoked in the last panel uh, about CCS, I just want to get that out of the way. Yes, Virginia states could mandate and have mandated effectively CCS for coal. The California uh, fossil energy standard requires that any coal sold into the state, even by wire, meet a gas level standard, which effectively means CCS. So it, it has been applied to both existing and new plants, and there's no federal preemption. So I hate to disappoint, Rob, but I don't think we're as far apart as you might think. Um, the, uh, in fact, the Clean Air Task Force um, has been very aggressive in advocating a, a, a big domestic innovation program in the United States. I think the point that my colleague Sam was trying to make is, uh, and I, we wouldn't for a moment suggest that the fact that China's doing a lot means we shouldn't do stuff in the U.S. Um, I think the point we're trying to make is there is an, there is an ecosystem out there there, there, are, there is beneficial cooperation between companies, I would argue particularly in this kind of engineering space for technology which we largely know about. I just want to dry, so I'm going to get back to, I have a couple quibbles, but I want to make the, the basic point. Uh, I, in broad brush, I think I would agree. It, the, the ideal state is that both the U.S. and China are moving very aggressively. Um, and I want to argue a little bit about the, tech, the innovation point, but just, uh, the, just real quickly, I, just a couple, for those who haven't looked at these numbers, they're pretty astonishing, although the animation doesn't seem to be wor working, so I guess I'll just describe it. Um, maybe it's not worth it. The, the, uh, the visuals, um, we're just going to show you that the, um, that the uh, U.S. market uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, and I just had to advance a few more. Um, just this is the electricity market um, in the U.S. Oh, did I lose it now? All right, back. Um, so this is the the electricity market. Uh, something's wrong here. This thing isn't really moving. There's there's that that's the electricity market. U.S. growth in electricity demand to 2035. And let's see, China should be somewhere in here. Boy, this is cumbersome. Okay, you can just see the disparity there. It tells you the whole story in terms of who's building what. Um, and where is the space to really grow um, demand uh, and, and to, to, to sponsor large in infrastructure projects. Um, same story if you move over to emissions, which seems to be taking about 15 clicks, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, the emissions disparity is about the same. In fact, the IA has, has emissions decreasing. So for emissions reasons alone, CO2 emissions reasons alone, can you move that forward from where you sit? Uh, or do I have to do that? 
Um, yeah, that's the U.S. Uh, projected emissions growth to 2035 and CO2, and there you see China. So, you know, from a, from a planetary standpoint, you want to see China doing a lot of large carbon-free infrastructure. You know, everyone talks about wind and solar in China and all the wonderful things they're doing. It is dwarfed. The, I believe the, the, uh, the projected wind build is something like 50, 70 more gigawatts uh, uh, through 2020. The projected coal build is about 300 gigawatts. So these are big numbers. Um, the, um, the, the, the point really, I would, uh, I would also agree with Rob that, that the, the big value added of China, at least in the next 20 years, is this large scale um, build. And um, we're seeing um, a number of, of uh, Sam mentioned the fact that uh, very large carbon capture and storage projects are moving forward in China now that we can't seem to muster in the United States the will to finance. And I think that's a bad thing, Rob. I think it's, it's good that the Chinese are doing, are, are helping to bring the cost down, but I think it's also good. We are, we're actually ahead of them, I think, uh, in, in a number of key areas like CCS in nuclear engineering, we're ahead of them. And there's no reason we shouldn't be pushing as well and demoing and building first of kind um, in the United States. But the fact is we're not and I think part of our view on this is that um, you know let's 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 recognize the reality um, and that's one reason why the my organization has an office in China that's just devoted to developing joint ventures between the US uh, and Chinese companies um, which uh, recognize of course that, it, that it's largely going to be a private sector to private sector thing because the US government's not spending any money on this on this topic um, there's uh, there's a brochure in the back that describes some of these um, uh, some of these uh, business to business connections um, Rob where I would quibble a little bit is the notion that China has no capability or no significant capability to innovate in the sort of more breakthrough or um, you know really step change approach. Um, the only and I can just offer you a couple examples. Um, the um, Tsinghua University um, is building the first uh, pebble bed high temperature uh, nuclear reactor at sort of 200 megawatt scale anywhere in the world. Um, that has fundamentally new thinking and technology. It is based on a German and U.S. design, but it is, there are some major innovations in that that, that, that are going into that that I think the engineers involved would describe as, as pretty significant, um, not just sort of tweaking or, or cost control. The other interesting phenomenon that I observed of being over in Beijing and visiting some of the, the startup companies in, in China is that they're outsourcing some of their innovation back to the United States, oddly enough. Um, and they do that in two ways. One is uh, you'll wander, you'll run into Chinese-speaking um, um, managers in some of these uh, uh, energy companies, and you'll find after a few minutes that they are actually Americans. They're Chinese Americans who might have been stalled out somewhere in the middle of GE and Schenectady, decided to hell with that. You know, I can run a billion-dollar division over here. So they're actually buying U.S. talent. You know, the Chinese Americans are fluent, uh, biculturally fluent, and um, then the other phenomenon observed is some of them are actually uh, onshoring or reshoring or whatever you want to call it um, uh, innovation centers back in the United States. So for example there's a company outside of Beijing called ENN that's doing a lot in coal gasification and so forth that actually has an R&D facility in Santa Monica. Um, so you know it's, it's, I think the picture is a little muddier than I think it's getting a little blurrier um, as to what's American and what's Chinese. My final point Rob is on the, on the JVs um, uh, you know it, it is certainly true True, and I've certainly read about coercive JVs. Um, I, we talk to comp American companies who uh, have um, worked it out, you know, and, and they're, the, the basic way they're working it out is they're saying, we're not going to try and keep the Chinese companies out of the Chinese markets, but we are going to enforce IP and, and we're going to really do joint ventures outside. Now, you uh, last night at dinner were quite skeptical that anyone's ever going to be able to enforce anything. But I think the fact, if you go to Norway to build a CCS project, there, there are laws and, I mean, there are court, there's a functional court system in Norway. Um, and, you know, uh, and I think the lawyers have gotten pretty clever about uh, determining where these disputes are arbitrated. So I think there are workarounds on this. I'm not, I guess I'm not really disputing your basic point. Um, I think we're a little lot more optimistic, but the one thing I don't want you to take away is that China's activism is a reason for American quietism. That's absolutely not our position. Let me, let me follow up there for just yeah. one second. I mean, it, it sounds to me, and this is unfair to you, but so I want sure. to get your chance to that at the end, your argument is that 
Uh, given, given the electricity needs and the potential <coughs> pollution that that could create, and given the willingness of the Chinese to spend far more money than seems to be in the works in the United States, that, that he who has the goal rules. In other words, if, if in fact, it violates some sense of fairness or some set of rules about intellectual property that we just have to get over it. That, that this is the new reality and um, uh, work out the problems beyond that. But in other words, we, can't, we cannot uh, stand on principle in the face of those kinds of numbers. Yeah, I, I would emphatically say that's not what I'm saying. Oh, okay. um, I, I'm not saying that you don't enforce IP and that you don't try and do things in the right. sort of WTO approach. Um, that's not my point at all. Um, what I am concerned about, and the reason I'm sort of maybe overcompensating in the other direction, maybe Sam earlier may have been construed to go too far in the other direction, is we are concerned that the China uh, the concern about China IP and China WTO may freeze some of the beneficial cooperation that we see going on. In other words, I think it's a, it's a, it's a more complicated picture and there are ways in which if this turns into a trade war and we're just in the position where U.S. corporations will take no technology over to China because of these concerns, um, I think we're in a bad place. Okay. That was really my point. Fair enough. Jamie? A trade war. Um, First, let me say that my comments are my own, and they are off the record. They don't re represent Senator Wyden's. Um, but, it, but I think when it comes to China, you know, they joined the WTO 10 years ago, and they have a history replete with breaking their commitments, whether it's on subsidies, whether it's on IPR enforcement, whether it's on currency. And just imagine for a minute, if we were here today, and we were bemoaning the fact that China was out inventing and out innovating us, We'd be having a conversation about how do we redouble our efforts as American policymakers to ensure that we win the race to the top. But instead, we're having this conversation and, and frankly, uh, an argument about how we get China to play by the rules so that we have a level playing field. And that's an unfortunate place to be, but that's, that's where we are. But I think a, a critical point is we have global trading rules. We have a rules-based system that's designed to promote competition, designed to promote innovation. And that's what they've done. I mean, for the last 60 years, the, the, the early adopters of the rules-based trade system you know, pro were propelled to the top of the economic pie, you know, the United States and the, and the Western countries that signed on to the GATT after, after the Second World War. And so, you know, the question before this panel really is whether China's energy and trade policies are stifling innovation or more fully enabling the adoption of clean energy. Uh, that question is a good one that can simply be answered, well, can mainly be answered by asking whether China is adhering to global trade rules. Now, those of us, I think everyone in this room probably subscribes to the fact that climate change is caused mainly by human activity. And so the recent growth of the, you know, the global uh, market for clean energy is welcome news. It's welcome news to the producers of solar energy, particularly the producers in, in Oregon, um, especially because the solar market's quadrupled. The global solar market's quadrupled in, in just the last five years. And you know, if you think about the market, for decades it's the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans who have, who have really led in this space. Um, but what's happened over the last few years is really significant. You've seen China suddenly emerge. If you look at just the last four years, uh, imports of, of solar cells and modules from China have increased 1,500%. Now, China, just in the U.S. market, is rapidly taking market share from U.S. producers, Japanese producers, and German producers. And you have to ask yourself, is that happening because they're out innovating us um, or not? And, and it's not just an American phenomenon. If you look at China's share of the solar market in the major markets around the world, you'll see the same story, that China's share is rapidly growing at the expense of all the other major producers well, at the same time, the global, the global pie, the global market's growing. So China's not only taking market share, but they're outpacing global growth of solar technology demand. If you look at the last five years, their, their share of global exports of, of 
of solar was about, you know, five years ago it was about 13%. Today it's over 30%. So they've tripled their, their market share, the global market share. And it, it, this is not just an accident. This wasn't, you know, the invisible hand of the market that just propelling, you know, Chinese ingenuity to, to dominate the global solar market. It's part of the 11th and 12th five-year plan. And that's the, that's the fact of it. I mean, over 90% of China's production of solar is for export. And so th this question about, you know, sh should we maybe just have a new reality uh, and ignore WTO rules uh, because it's in our interest to deploy solar, um, I don't think we can do that from a trade policy perspective generally. Otherwise, we basically say China gets to develop a five-year plan do whatever they want to do to implement it, and the United States and the rest of the world will compete for the leftovers. I don't think that's where we want to be. The place we want to be is saying, we have global trade rules that promote competition fairly, and innovation, and we'll all compete. Now, the question for the US government is whether the policies that China are implementing are consistent with the global trade rules, or consistent with US law. Now, we know that the Steelworkers 301 petition identified lots of subsidies the Chinese were providing to producers of clean energy technology, including solar. A bunch of subsidies were mentioned on the panel today. Uh, the, uh, the, the USTR has recently identified subsidies that the Chinese are providing that they failed to notify the WTO about. Um, and the, the petition, the anti-dumping and countervailing duty petition filed by SolarWorld and the other supporters of the petition also identified over 40 subsidies that they believe are countervailable. That the types of, they are the types of subsidies where we can impose trade remedies on. Now, the question for the U.S. government is, you know, are those subsidies actionable? Uh, the subsidies identified in the solar world case. Um, and are those import, those Chinese solar panel imports from China, are they being dumped? And if the answer is yes, then the United States ought to impose anti-dumping and countervailing duty, duties to remedy the unfair trade, to remedy the dumping and to remedy the subsidies. And they ought to take, they ought to file a WTO case and ask for consultations with China, the WTO, to get them to stop illegally subsidizing production of this technology. I mean, that's, that's what ought to happen. Now, I know that some people say that, you know, and I sympathize with the thought that, that when it comes to the deployment of clean energy, who cares if China subsidizes it? The greater objective is cheaper solar, solar that, compete, that can compete with fossil fuels like, like coal and gas. But, you know, if we let the solar, the global solar market become completely occupied by Chinese producers who, through unfair trade practices, crowded out their competition, we will have not rewarded innovation, we will have rewarded cheating. And we will be left with a solar industry that doesn't have more competition and more innovation, but it has one player that doesn't have any incentive to compete and innovate. And it's the innovation that's going to ultimately bring solar and other clean energy technologies to a more competitive position in the marketplace. Should I encourage people to get some questions up here? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jamie, I, I, one thing I wanted to encourage people, if they have questions, I guess we have a form to fill out. You can begin to send those questions up. But Jamie, I wanted to follow up here. Um, implicit in what you're arguing for, I think it's two things. One is that uh, these trade cases can actually be effective and succeed. Uh, a WTO case takes 18 months. Um, there, there in our history are examples of successful dumping cases that still didn't save the industry. Um, color television sets is one that comes to mind of years ago. Um, uh, so one is why do you think that pursuing trade rules, other than making us feel good, and you know, we can justify that we're in the right and they're in the wrong, why that will help the industry? Um, uh, in part because there's at least a mixed record of not only the Chinese but others actually delivering on the intent of a, of a judgment rather than the letter of the judgment. In other words, the Chinese actually have a fairly good record of actually, if something's prohibited, stopping it, but then finding another way around it, as many of other trading partners have done too. So the question is, even if you win, do you succeed? 
So uh, I, I think the, the purpose for the, the trade case that was filed, and I think it's important to recognize that the, the solar case that was filed was filed by domestic industry. This wasn't a government decision to take a look. They ultimately, the government accepted the petition, but industry thinks that they're being harmed and they're spending a lot of money to file the case because they think that if they can win the case, they can survive. And when I talk to them, they think they don't survive if they don't, if they don't impose anti-dumping and countervailing duties. So the record may be mixed, but there are, there are examples where uh, anti-dumping and countervailing duties have saved industries. We have a steel industry that's still here. The, here in part because they were aggressive about seeking trade remedies when a lot of cheap steel was coming in from Eastern Europe, for, for instance. Um, and your question really is, okay, so you win the case, how do you enforce it? And you're right, a, a perfect example of that is uh, right now uh, about, oh, about a third of the anti-dumping countervailing duty orders that are out there are on Chinese goods. Um, what we're finding more and more uh, in the subcommittee is that uh, rather than shipping the, the, the goods directly to the U.S. now, those Chinese suppliers that are subject to the orders will transship the merchandise through Singapore and Malaysia to get around the duties by, by committing some fraud. So you're right, enforcement is a challenge, but that doesn't mean you don't try. Yeah. And I, I think industry wouldn't, w wouldn't be trying to get these duties imposed if they didn't think they would, they, they would help and they didn't think that they could be enforced. And, and let me lastly say, it's already having an impact. I mean, just filing the case, if, if you look at what happened on the market and the conversations that's happened in the city and what's happened in industry, you're already hearing people saying, you know, domestic, you know, U.S. companies that have moved some of their production to China saying, you know what, there's a lot of uncertainty. We think we might move our production back because we don't know what these duties are going to mean for us. And we can compete here. And if these duties are in place, it might actually level the playing field that we don't have an advantage uh, to produce in China. Great. Can I make yeah. a, just a yeah. quick point? Because I, I think I've been struggling with this all day, or at least since the, the, the previous panel. Um, that I think these, there are two different conversations going on here. Um, there's the sort of conversation about the commoditized part of the, the supply chain, like solar panels, um, that you know you're really in a commodity competition, mass manufacture kind of thing, and then you're kind of in these billion-dollar level infrastructure investments, or where you have to do the first of a kind pebble bed reactor. Um, I think one of the points my colleague Sam was trying to make is the next uh, breakthroughs are great and deep innovation is great uh, and, and it should be uh, sponsored but I think our view is that as far as decarbonization goes in the next two to three decades it's mostly going to be about really big stuff um, gigawatt scale pebble bed reactors large scale CCS that we largely know how to do and, and that's kind of so that's a different I think that's a different set of China US uh, activities that are than this mm -hmm. sort of more commoditized competition there's just a lot of white space in the one gigawatt scale and believe me we wish there wasn't so much white space in the U US on that but but I th I, it's too bad that the the solar thing has been come the poster child and that's I think all we we're trying to say is if you get completely focused on that as the way you think about the China US energy relationship you might you might come up with the wrong strategy well, I, I, look yeah. a little different. I look at this three spaces there's the commoditized solar there's the next gen and then there's this big scale stuff mm -hmm. and but look you are I don't really I, I, I understand your argument that you know they're the ones who have all the projected emissions and they're the ones who are going to build all the plants and therefore isn't this great they get to dominate that but you know the last I looked at it it was called global trade we invented most of these technologies we should be selling the Chinese these technologies now what the Chinese are doing is they essentially uh, I think they were asleep the day they taught Ricardo in economics <laughs> In other words, I fundamentally don't believe the Chinese think about comparative advantage. I think the Chinese think about absolute advantage. And if you read the, it's called the MLP, the, the 2006 Medium and Long Term Technology Plan, which I really encourage you to read it, because to me it's a pretty scary manifesto, because it lays out in pretty clear black and white the Chinese goal, which is to dominate all phases of production in all industries. So it's not just that the Chinese want to be good at clean energy and CCS and a few other things and then we'll, we'll sell them airplanes and we'll sell them semiconductors and we'll sell them software. They want to steal the software, 
force Boeing to transfer their technology there and force Intel to transfer their technology and then steal it so they can make it. So to me it would be a wonderful world if the Chinese are saying, you know, we're pulling up all these coal plants and we're going to take our 350 to 400 billion dollar trade circles with America and we're going to buy some GE plants or whoever makes these. We're going to buy some of this technology and install it. To me that's the win-win because that, I think we're better at driving the technology. You know, they can make some incremental gains. So I don't really see it that, that just because they're doing supply that that's um, somehow this inherent uh, thing that they should also be doing, and that they're doing demand that they should also do supply. We can yeah, do supply. And, and Rob, I, I wasn't arguing that. I think the JV, if you, we, we don't have time to go into it, but that's what these JVs are. They are licensing. Um, the, the U.S. companies are making a lot of money. A lot, you know, there's a lot of people employed on this. Now, we can argue about whether those, those relationships are really going to hold. Um, uh, so I, I, I just want to be clear again that, that, that I'm not suggesting the, um, that it, an abdication of the, of the, of the you know, rules of trade or breaking contracts is appropriate. Um, but I do come back to the question, uh, the, the image I had in my mind was the blazing saddles when the sheriff points the gun at his head and says, you know, if you don't, whatever, you know, I'm going to shoot myself. I mean, there is a little bit of that problem. We could sit here and hold our breath and say, unless, you know, until we get everything sorted out, w you know, damn it, you can't build a, you know, a high, uh, high temperature gas cooled reactor, you know, using anything that has any American IP in it. And I, you know, I think, or we're not going to even enter that conversation because we feel like we might get ripped off. And I think there's, I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but I, I do worry about that sort of, you know, self-defeating approach. There's got to be a, there's got to be a middle path here. Okay, great. We've got an, uh, uh, about up 15 minutes and we've got um, uh, a number of questions from the audience, which I must admit, keep growing. And, <laughs> um, are uh, uh, understandably coming at this from various different uh, points of view. We have one question here. It's an interesting one, and, and Armin, maybe you can maybe you can address. Maybe maybe Rob, you've got some sense of this. Uh, the question is that we have a lot of money coming into the United States from China. I assume this person is presuming that there's money coming into this technology era space, but I don't know that. Do, do we know? I, I was going to well, comment money? on that. Well, well, you're beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, there are examples of Chinese companies investing in U in U.S. manufacturing. Wenjing, for example, has a, a solar manufacturing plant. And in is Illinois. that advancing or or deterring U.S. innovation? Uh, you know, I I. I don't know what to tell you. If you believe that innovation depends on local manufacturing experience and iteration, then you would say the Illinois plant probably we're internalizing some of that. Uh, I'm not. I can't give you the specifics, but I can tell you a number of Chinese companies are looking at very significant investment on U.S. soil of carbon capture and storage plants, uh -huh. um, which I think you know. Again, you'll have American engineers, you'll have American companies cooperating on that. So we are beginning to see a reverse flow of capital. Um. I've got a question, a couple of questions here on trade. Jimmy, I'll ask you one. Uh, one is, I, I think there's a an simple one answer to this, but since I'm not a lawyer, and maybe you are, you are, so maybe we can answer this one, is uh, if the trade rules in the WTO take so long, why can't we simply impose immediate tariffs, get that, those funds escrowed, and return them in case the case is lost? Well, that's basically, well, two things. That's sort of the challenge of, of, of the way the WTO works is you, you, you see a practice that you think is illegal, you file a case that takes a long time, you win, then all that happens is the, 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 the bad practice stops. You're, you haven't remedied all of the damage that happened be between when the practice started and when the case was resolved. So that's kind of a, that's a problem with the WTO rules. The, the case that's been filed in solar it, it, it gets around that and it basically says, yes, the investigation as to whether there was dumping and wh whether the subsidies were the types of subsidies that we should impose trade remedies on. That investigation does take a year, but and that happens under U.S. law. But we're already at the point now, now Commerce initiated the investigation two weeks ago, or a week ago, that all of the imports that are coming in now are potentially subject to duties. So a year from now, if the case shows that yes, we should impose anti-dumping duties and countervailing duties of 150%, they can still be collected on the imports that are coming in potentially now if the Commerce Department wants them to because of the way that our custom systems work. You can always go back. You can go back to a certain uh, point in time. So this case is important for importers now because those panels might be subject to duties 
uh, a year from now. The other thing I just quickly yeah. say, I mean, in our view, there's sort of two kinds of mercantilists. There's the occasional kind, like you know, France once in a while, or us once in a while, or the Canadians once in a while on plywood. Uh, and then there's systemic mercantilists, and systemic mercantilists have to be dealt with differently. And I don't think we can, and China is a systemic mercantilist, and I don't think essentially a rules-based regime works with China. I think we have to we have to keep pursuing that, but fundamentally we have to move to a performance-based regime that holds them accountable for a set of major goals. One of the major goals being stop running huge trade surpluses with us. How they figure that out, that's kind of their business. Because I, what we end up doing with China is we play whack-a-mole. We do one, and then they come up with another one. They do some standards manipulation, we go and we fight it. Then they come up with another one a couple of months later. And we just keep doing this over and over again. And they know that game. They know they can win that game because it takes so long to go through this process. So I think fundamentally we've got to move to that kind of system. But let me, let me follow up on, on that one, because that is a debate we had in the 1980s about Japan. Sure. That and the whack-a-mole analogy, I think, is the right one. Is is that uh, they can keep inventing new schemes that we can't, you know, we can't be innovative enough to follow to 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 to, uh, to respond to. Yet the debate we had in the U.S., which is basically to say there has to be a, a better balance of benefits in the trading relationship, there has to be more reciprocity in the trading relationship. Uh, that debate was lost by the side that argued in favor of that for I'd say purely ideological reasons uh, but also for reasons that we had companies at least now we do at China we have companies that benefit from that unbalanced relationship and that leads me actually to, to a, two questions we've got here I will follow what is the role since there are private companies involved in this relationship and there are private companies that are um, in this space, in this, this technology space, who are producing in China and are benefiting from the subsidies that China produces. How does that affect our ability to affect this issue? Because we've got um, American companies who are benefiting from, maybe, maybe they're not benefiting from the stealing of their technology, but they're certainly benefiting from some of the other Chinese. Um, uh, I mean, I can take it, crack it, and then do yeah. I mean, quickly, I, 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 we didn't win that that, that rules-oriented debate in Japan era. We didn't lose it either because, you know, one of the main reasons why the Japanese car companies invested and built plants in the U.S. because they knew that if they didn't do that, there was going to be a rules-based regime imposed upon them. We saw the same thing with semiconductors. So we didn't go all, and, and President Reagan was actually a huge supporter of those policies. So it wasn't quite a loss, I would argue. Today, I think it, it's a little bit different, um, partly because I think the sort of free trade, uberalist ideology has taken over Washington. And there sort of was a strategic trade theory that was going on back then, which seems to have been largely ignored or forgotten. But you know, just in talking to companies, I've noticed this significant shift of, of talking to US companies within the last 12 to 18 months. Prior to that, it was all about China is this huge, giant market. Let's just go. And it's evolved over, wait a minute, this is not working anymore. It really isn't working. The systemic problems, whether it's standards manipulation, IP theft, forced tech transfer. So I think a lot of US companies are rethinking their China position. And even, even companies that sort of are used to benefit from that, they've got a lot of production over there. They're, at least the ones I've talked to are getting very skittish. They, they really, really don't like it. And, and they think we've got to step up. And they might not want to go as far as some folks, but they want to do something more. Uh, Armin, unless Jamie, you want to jump sure, in here. Yeah. Sure, I, I, I would just say, if you look at the, the issue of China currency, that helps, gives you some sort of insight as to kind of where the Congress is and where, where the business community is. And the fact is China's the second largest economy now. Is they're a major purchaser of, of American products, uh, Oregon and even Washington. A lot of lot of states, China is the number one export market. Multinationals, American multinationals, have a significant presence in China. Uh, on the other side, you've got you know kind of your domestic, purely domestic industry that is clearly more and more frustrated with China. The relationship, you know, what's going on is really it's really really complicated. But the fact that the Congress can't even bring itself to impose some some duties that are arguably, you know, that we're able to legally impose. We're not even able to pass legislation because we can't get 
a consensus among the business community speaks to how complicated the relationship is. Now, I do, I think there, there are potential opportunities in front of us. First, Europe's woes may be good for the US-China relationship because it's up to us as kind of co-economic leaders. Um, but also, the, the president's new agenda on, 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 in the Pacific, he's been negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is important, but Japan just last weekend decided that they wanted to join the talks. And that announcement was followed by Canada and Mexico deciding to, to join the talks. And if this free trade pact could come together in the right sort of way, you could see the type of pressure it may impose on China to say, if you want to join a pact like this, you've got to be as ambitious as the rest of these countries. Otherwise, trade and investment is going to be distorted away from China. So there are a couple of potential helpful opportunities to, to, aside from throwing them out of the WTO or something like that. I mean, why, uh, we, we do have Chinese companies who are working in this space, who, some of whom are closer to the government and some of whom are, are not. Um, how does that competition, how is that evolving inside the Chinese domestic market? It's fascinating. Um, you know, it's, I, I could, I, we have a, we have a, a Chinese national or a Chinese born guy who spent a lot of time in the States who still can't figure this out. Um, it's a very complicated pecking order and um, I would say that it's, it's actually been a pretty good competition. We've seen, well, what the start up there might be 5,000 people, uh, you know, but the, some of the more innovative companies uh, like ENN, which is at, right in Langfang, right, right outside of Beijing, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting because even within China, they can't get the time of day from the utilities. Um, and it's, and they actually needed an American partner to come in to legitimate themselves to a utility. The utility, you know, the, the utilities are the yeah. big dogs. They've got the status. So I, you know, it's, it's, it is, I'm not going to suggest they have wild, wide open competition at all. I'm far from it. The state's hand is all, is all over the, the infrastructure projects. And again, that's, you know, that's a good thing in the sense that I don't know that it goes into, it's really a subsidy, but clearly there's going to be no tariff recovery in, unless the state is okay with, you know, you going out and building this large project. But I don't know if that's what you were driving at. There is a little ecosystem developing. Yeah. And one thing that's very healthy is that we are seeing these smaller companies with innovative technology. They're the ones that are tending to reach out and partner with the U.S. counterparts um, for the most part. There are some cases where the U.S. companies like PowerSpan are hooking up with a very large Chinese utility. But we're beginning to see more uh, situations where you've got, I would call them American style companies, that much more sort of Silicon Valley feel to them in these office parks outside and, of Beijing. Is there any evidence yet, and it may be too soon for this, of a kind of step change innovation in solar uh, because of this, this kind of ecosystem that's evolving? I, I can't speak to solar. In the gasification space, um, I would say that um, you have to go to this uh, this park, this demonstration park outside of Beijing to believe this, but I, I th but what's interesting is that they are, I think they're accomplishing a lot of it by bringing in Chinese American trained managers mm -hmm. who come in and they, they, the, the woman who was running the, the, the R&D program in the gasification space was actually someone they grabbed from Caltech or something like that. So, you know, she was, she was fluent in Mandarin. So, um, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I do, I do uh, share Rob's general view. My general impression is that most of what's going on is still an iterative engineering thing rather than step change. And I think the people, if you've ever been to a Chinese university, uh, you know what the the, what the, the feeling is, it's still medieval. That the, that the, the um, you know, for the most part, the graduate students are, you know, getting the tea for the professor. They're not engaged in the conversation. So I think the academics I've talked to there have said, until that changes, you know, you're probably not going to get this massive amounts of step change. They're they're kind of going to try and buy it by by buying some of the American talent. Anybody want to jump in here? No. Um, I have, there's a question here actually, and, and I don't know whether Jamie or, or, or Rob might want to jump in here. It's an interesting question. We, we have a case before the WTO now on Chinese rare earths. And um, these rare earths are part of what is needed for a lot of these innovative new technologies. Uh, we don't know how that case is going to get resolved uh, because it's an export uh, quota case in essence. Um, but um, it just so happens I was talking to somebody at the WTO today about this and they're not sure how this is going to break. 
in essence, in the, on the appeal. Um, uh, is, do you hear from industry about their concerns about how this case is finally resolved? Yeah, I mean, the fact that this is even a debatable point suggests how badly flawed the global trading system is. Because the Chinese are basically an export behemoth. Their, their entire goal is to reduce their imports and expand their exports, except in one industry, and that's rare earth elements, mm -hmm. where they don't want exports. Now, why is that? Why would they not want to do that? It's because this is this, the, the Chinese actually bought a rare earth mine in Nevada. You know what they did with it? They shut it down. So if you can say after me, predatory pricing, that's essentially what they're doing. They have this core technology. They know it's a key thing that companies have to have. And so they're basically saying, if you want access to this, you've got to come to China and put your factory here. So it's really this sort of flip side. It's not really that they're trying to get rid of exports. It's they're trying to get, again, more exports. The people who are really, really upset with this are the Japanese. And that's where I'm, I, I think Jamie's got it right on the, the head. The Japanese are incredibly frustrated because they're more dependent on rare earths than we are for a lot of their industries. And they see this as a direct threat from the Chinese to their economy. So, I mean, to me, I don't see how you cannot win this case. I mean, if this case does not win clearly, then it really says this thing, this thing doesn't work because it allows one company, one country with impunity to manipulate global markets essentially like an, a monopolist using predatory pricing. And it does seem to be, it raises an issue if they do win on appeal on this case. And there is, for those of you who are lawyers in the room, and like I say, I'm not a lawyer, there, there is a case to be made sure. that this is uh, an, a material, and a, a resource in declining supply, and it's vital national interest, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all these exemptions that can be used. But it does, it seems to me, calls into question the, the trade law pursuit of many of these issues because you could find ways to where trade law just doesn't apply in this case or doesn't apply in that case or we can't enforce or whatever and and then we're back to square one in terms of what we do it, it, it's a really important case and it's it's especially hard because it's an issue where you have to determine what was the intent behind the Chinese to limit the rare earths. If it was, yeah. the intent was to, because it was a scarce resource that they wanted to manage and not deplete, well that's okay. If it was for some other purpose, then that's not okay. Now, like you, we've seen the Chinese, every time they get in some little tiff with the Japanese, cut back their rare earths export, so they just shut them off completely. So we've, we've seen behavior that suggests this is not about managing scarce resources, but this is a really tough case and if, if, if they win, uh, the U.S. and Japan and others will be in a tough spot and will have to figure out what to do because, you're right, we have global trade rules, but we negotiate them with every other WTO member, which means that they are not adequate all the time. Um, we're at the closing time, so if, I, if anyone has any final comments they want to make, otherwise I'd like to bring this panel to a close. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All right, well, thank you, Bruce. I, I'm a little biased, but I thought that was the best panel of the day. <laughs>